Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for choosing our session this afternoon, Philanthropy's Quest for Equity, Past, Present, and Future. Um, it's been a great conference so far, and we're excited to be a part of the closing afternoon um, today on Friday. So my name is Carol Glanville. I'm a Learning Services Program Manager here at the Johnson Center for Philanthropy at Grand Valley State University, and I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleague, Tiana Hover. Tiana, you want to give a shout out? Absolutely. Thanks, Carol. Um, as Carol said, my name is Tiana Hover, and I am the office coordinator here at the Johnson Center, and I also chair our internal uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion team, uh, and I'm happy to be here with you today. Great. So um, as you're settling in, if you haven't had a chance yet to introduce yourself, if you want to just put in the chat uh, your name, uh, your organization, and if you know it, the approximate founding year for your organization, so you can kind of see where it fits in with the information we're sharing today. And you can go ahead with that while we um, wrap up some of this housekeeping stuff um, here uh, coming into the session. So we're delighted to be with you today to facilitate this discussion of the historical context of past and present actions in philanthropy's role in advancing equity and how that might inform us to shape the future of philanthropy in the quest for social and racial justice. This particular presentation was originally designed by Dr. Juan Olivares as part of his work here at the Johnson Center um, as a distinguished scholar in residence for DEI. And this was done in partnership with the Council for Michigan Foundations. So we've modified the content just a little bit to fit the time frame today. If you'd like to join us for what would be normally a two-hour workshop on this topic, uh, which includes facilitated discussion and application, please join us on November 9th. Um, to save the link, we're going to pop the link in the chat here for you. Um, and if you'd like to uh, save that link, go ahead and register, bring a friend. Um, we'd love to have you there. And the goal for today then is really just to uh, give you some clear understanding of the historical context of equity in philanthropy. And we're going to do that um, with looking at the first 150 years of American philanthropic history through these different eras of development. Uh, we'll integrate particular historical events to illustrate the story of equity in America and philanthropy's role. Often these historical events are quite painful and difficult to grapple with. And because the history of philanthropy is not just one of benevolence, filling the void created by poverty, lack of access and or lack of government support, but it's also one of greed, mistrust and missteps. And it has also contributed to forces that are at the roots of inequity in America today. So it's our duty as we engage in diversity, equity and inclusion work to investigate history, to develop our understanding of the causes of inequity. So we'll briefly explore these periods um, in which philanthropy has engaged in some ways to overcome inequity, as well as some ways in which the field has missed opportunities to embrace equitable practice. And this is how we present each time period. You will see the time period um, from 1860 through 2020 identified at the top of the screen. And then you'll see the names of um, the era right underneath the time. And then under that, um, we'll call out some of the social movements in those dark gold bars. And then in the circles, you'll see significant national events. And finally, the blue timeline at the bottom will identify relevant philanthropic events and efforts. So you're gonna see all that information together, like the history, the social movements, um, you know, and what philanthropy was doing alongside that. So we're going to start with Reconstruction and the Gilded Age, and there are a few major themes in this era, uh, including the roots of charity and who it attempted to provide support for. Also, how prejudice about individual or family-based self-sufficiency often looked down on poor people, and particularly people who at the time were not seen as white, including Black people, Native Americans, and immigrants. In terms of practices, it's important to take away from this era that philanthropists who were majority white men and some women gained power through control of wealth and often imposed their own ideas of opportunity into their philanthropic giving. And also be aware of how this maintained a racial hierarchy. So starting with the late 19th century, we have two overlapping periods, the Reconstruction Era, which is post-Civil War, and the Gilded Age, <laughs> during which these select social movements were taking place. 
The late 1800s were a gilded age in the sense that the wealth creation, industrialization, and urbanization of the era appeared to be glittering on the surface for a few, but it contained a corruption and suffering underneath for the majority. As part of Reconstruction, the Freedmen's Borough was established and became the first federal social welfare program in the United States. The Bureau worked with a series of Freedmen's Aid Societies to implement services. Many had developed from abolitionist groups and represented different religious denominations, secular efforts, and particularly Black-led mutual aid activities. So this is an early example of how charitable services partnered with federal welfare programs. However, despite the violence and trauma of 250 years of chattel slavery by this point, the Federal Bureau lasted only seven years and focused on minimizing responsibilities in an effort to avoid pauperizing or making newly freed Black people who they were supposed to help supposedly dependent on services. So this rigid focus on self-help as a solution to poverty, as well as deciding on who was deserving poor and who was undeserving, is also reflected in the formalization of charity in America at this time. A scientific philanthropy and organized charity movement was prominent in the 1870s until about the 1930s, with a major outcome being the first charity organization societies. They sought to more efficiently use resources to promote registration and supervision of application applicants for charity and provided the roots for nonprofits today, including the first United Ways and the field of social work. During this time, though many held helped with basic needs amidst growing poverty, most did little to challenge racial barriers and classist perceptions, they themselves perpetuating them. This was also occurring at the same painful time that the American eugenics movement and social Darwinism, a pseudoscience that was used to justify racial racism and imperialism were prominent. In Michigan, J.H. Kellogg, the brother of W.K. Kellogg, created the Race Betterment Foundation, which reflected many of the mainstream ideas about racial hierarchy and funded national conferences up until World War I in Battle Creek on, quote, increased efficiency, well-being, and race improvement. This reflects the mindsets about poverty, self-sufficiency, and racial formation of the time. Around this time as well, following the Civil War, there were philanthropic efforts to support the advancement of formal knowledge, and we'll look particularly at secondary educational aid in the rural South. Philanthropy provided funding at a time when state governments explicitly neglected their duties to public Southern education. However, historians have looked at how these efforts were primarily through the lens of white men and some white women who, quote, used their own vision of black people's place in the Southern economy. They hesitated to give power to local people on the ground, such as insisting that Black people could not fill supervisory roles at schools. Historian Sarah Thusen assessed that these philanthropists, quote, genuinely believed in Black opportunity, but stopped short of advocating Black autonomy. Philanthropy's efforts in this space largely left racial hierarchy intact. In leaving this hierarchy in place, Reconstruction as a whole is widely regarded as a failure. This exemplified in the landmark Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson, which ruled in a seven to one decision that separate but equal was constitutional and built on the segregation and violence against black people widespread after the Civil War. So I have one last um, piece on this period. And if you have any questions or comments, please make sure you're putting them in the chat and we will get to those um, just in a minute here. So we're gonna look at Andrew Carnegie's formative work, The Gospel of Wealth. This has informed many philanthropist efforts since its writing. There were only 18 foundations that existed before 1910. And at the time, early philanthropists were often questioned with suspicion. Vast amounts of wealth were being accumulated by few. By 1897, the richest 4,000 families in the US representing less than 1% of the population had about as much wealth as the other 11.6 million families altogether. A core dilemma of the age emerged between understanding many industrialists who were also major philanthropists as robber barons versus captains of industry. An example of this is the generosity Carnegie wrote about in the Gospel of Wealth and engaged throughout the later years of his life, juxtaposed against his complicity in oppressive labor practices, including his role in one of the most well-known labor conflicts, the Homestead Steel Strike in Pittsburgh, one of thousands of strikes in the years to come. Steel workers were striking for equitable wages when armed guards hired by Carnegie were used against workers, turning the conflict violent. 
So we'll pause here uh, to see if there are any questions or comments. And I'm also going to um, switch over to my colleague. Uh, Tiana is going to take over the, uh, take the helm here. So let me just check if we have any questions. Uh, I don't see any questions so far, but thank you all. Oh, hi, Nellie. I see somebody here from Michigan Nonprofit Association. So somebody from the hometown is here. <laughs> um, and I see some other potentially familiar names here. So thank you all for joining us. All right, are we, are you all set, Tiana, ready to go? I am, I am ready. So all right, let me see if I can start. get the right thing up here. Just give me one second. And I think that does it. Okay. All right, oh, hang Thanks, on. Carol. Hang on, I gotta get to the right slide. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Let me see. What are we talking about? The progressive era? We are on there the progressive go. era and the Great All Depression. Right. Yeah. Okay. That this should be the right one. There we go. All right. There we go. So um, in this section, we're gonna look at the progressive era and the Great Depression and what was happening within grant making, uh, what foundations were doing, uh, what was also happening in terms of segregation and how that was continuing to be compounded. Um, and then some of the social justice and grassroots efforts that were starting to come about. And then also the critique of philanthropy as well as the suspicion of government. And what I find interesting um, in this, Carol, is that we're still hearing about that trust in philanthropy, like today in 2021, that is right. still still a topic uh, that is going on. So um, the beneficiaries now expanded to those who asked for money for initiatives. So grant making, grant making as we know it um, started during this period. So you started seeing prejudicial practices still existed as foundations continued to reflect the white establishment and deliberate practices on race segregation continued and was compounded. However, some philanthropy was promoting social justice endeavors by funding movements and grassroots. And then you also see wealth continuing to grow among elite and particular industries that required a lot of labor at low cost. And then, as we said, you're starting to see some of the critiques that are happening within philanthropy and the, and the government. So at the end of the Gilded Age, that gave rise to the progressive era in which there were several social movements on only a few of them are listed here. However, there were a lot of disparities in equity continuing. So despite women getting the right to vote in 1920, Native Americans, Blacks, Asian Americans, and Latino women had to continue to fight for their right to vote. Also during this time, there were several well-known key political events taking place. The H1N1 flu of 1918 took place during this. You also see a lot of racial violence against Blacks, Indigenous, and other people of color um, as well, um, part of that being the red summer of 1919 in which white supremacist violence and riot rebelliousness took place in more than three dozen cities. Immigrants too were treated with racism such as the Johnson Immigration Law of 1924, which based on race and nationality established quotas and excluded Asians and solidified the rationale for legal and social segregation. This was the rise of the eugenics movement in the United States and focused on race, which ones were inferior and which ones were superior. During this period, key political infrastructure was built for philanthropy, including the tax code that began nonprofits and formalized institutional giving such as the Revenue Acts of 1913, 1917, and 1921. Also, many of the largest foundations were established in the mid 20th century. Foundation dedicated, foundations dedicated to social justice also have their roots in this time. So this includes the American Fund for Public Service, known as the Garland Fund. Founded by Charles Garland, it was perhaps the first social justice foundation focused initially on Blacks in America as wealthy people increasingly began establishing foundations in this time period, suspicion of philanthropy continued to be very high. 
people began to ask whether private individuals should have such so much influence on the way social services were provided and questioned um, pro and protested labor conditions that many wealthy philanthropists employed to maximize maximize profits in their industry. Man, words are hard today. <laughs> so we're gonna move into the Great Depression right now and World War II era. So about this time, you've got Franklin D. Roosevelt winning in a landslide election against Republican incumbent Herbert Hoover. So prior to Roosevelt's administration, charity and social reform were primarily implemented by foundations and charities. However, during this time, the federal government was finally forced by market disruptions and poverty beyond the reach of private charity to accept roles it had previously rejected. It embraced systems that had been designed, tested, and promoted by private philanthropy. The Roosevelt administration launched the New Deal to stimulate the economy and support key social issues, with public aid expenditures increasing more than sixfold from 1933 to 1939. And the response to this new government intervention resulted in reductions in charitable giving. More key infrastructure also was happening during this time that um, had to do with regulation of giving and that was implemented in the 30s and 40s. So you have the first IRS 990 form being filed to help with transparency. The first donor advised fund was established then. And then key intermediaries such as the Council on Foundations were also founded. At the end of this period, the Cold War would set the stage for the next several decades to come, highlighting a key tension for philanthropy as it enters the 60s. You have the Cox Committee investigating foundations for communist activity due to their funding of progressive causes. The rise of social justice foundation foundations such as the Industrial Areas Foundation likely played a role in this kind of suspicion as they work with many different groups of people to build power. The Industrial Areas Foundation was established in 1940 by Saul David Alinsky and the mission of the new endeavor was to build from Alinsky's experience developing the Back of the Yards Neighborhood Council. The Back of the Yards Neighborhood Council was the first community organization in the nation and a groundbreaking venture that brought ordinary families a voice in the decisions impacting their lives. So this is an opportunity if you've got questions or comments about um, this period of time as we looked at the progressive area and the Great Depression, uh, you, you can drop those in the chat. Um, if you have comments as you've been kind of listening and uh, want to go back to maybe some things that Carol talked about in that first segment, feel free to drop those in the chat. And uh, while we're waiting to see if there's anything there, I'm going to get my screen up. Yeah, no, one thing I find really interesting as we go through this um, is how many of these themes live today. Like when we heard in in the first part about the concentration of wealth at the first, the top 1%, right? I mean, that's a movement we just experienced a couple of years ago, you know? Um, and so I think there, as you were saying, there are so many parallels, it's surprising. And we'll see that as we move through um, and get into these more modern times, how much there is that hasn't changed. Yes, I do find that very, very interesting um, how much we like to feel that the needle has really mm -hmm. moved. And when you start laying things out like this, ha having a better sense of like what mm -hmm. our history really is and where we're at. Yeah. Um, Allison has a question. To what extent was community participation in the 60s a reaction to wealthy private individuals? Um, influencing poverty intervention in the progressive era, and what does this pendulum swing mean for us now? That's a great question, Allison. Yes, it is. That is a really, really um, good Yeah, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we move forward um, and, and what happened there with, with some of the movements and how they were quelled. So yeah, we'll definitely uh, cover that a little bit more here going forward. So are we, are we all set, Tiana? Uh, yes, I believe we are. Hopefully, we should be on the Cold War era. So we're, I think we're ready I to go. see that. Okay. All right. So next, we turn to the Cold War era, uh, where we'll see that despite, let me get 
my screen organized here. I was too busy chatting. <laughs> Okay, um, so we'll see that despite being on the front lines of social change, Allison, few black led organizations saw investments from foundations. Um, the ones that did and provided key support were those that in some ways worked to give control to local activists pushing for change. Uh, we'll see different examples of how diversity in hiring fluctuated and attempts to democratize control of wealth in the 70s arose. But this gets a little complicated when we look at the rise of austerity that followed that in the 80s and 90s, in which government cuts to social welfare programs created a shift towards responsibility by the civil sector. And again, we'll see rise in critiques of philanthropy as well as the first major digital efforts to increase transparency. So there's a lot happening during this period because there was a lot. <laughs> Um, also, we have a significantly uh, more documentation from this time. So there were a myriad of social movements going on that exploded during the early part of this era, and they define the 60s and have continued to have great influence into today. Um, so you'll see that we're reaching all the way up to 2020 here just to show how these um, social movements have continued to impact the work that we do. There were key political shifts in this era, including several attempts to increase transparency and philanthropy. And this included the establishment of key infrastructure, such as the Foundation Center, um, which today is Candid, uh, and the, their databases and resource hub. Um, and as well, prior to this era, there were no rules regarding grant payments from private foundations, and two major commissions would inform the study of that regulation uh, in the 60s and 70s. So that's when um, foundation regulation came into place. During the same time period, there were some major missed opportunities to provide grassroots resources to promote equity. Many foundations were afraid to risk the turbulence of the time, uh, citing too much controversy. Historian Sean Dobson analyzed that too many executives in philanthropy then and now suffered from the misconception that injustice can be overcome entirely by private charitable service provision and without grassroots pressure or capacity investments in grassroots institutions. For the few foundations who did fund organizations at the grassroots level on the front lines of the civil rights movement, they were small to mid-sized family foundations that are shown here with endowments of less than $10 million when they started. So for example, the Field Foundation was one of the few to fund the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in the 1950s. So however, knowing this missed opportunity, foundations needed to be careful about movement capture. Political scientist Megan Ming Francis coined the term from her studies of this era, uh, where the power that funders have shaped the priorities and tactics of activist groups often towards familiar and incremental approaches to change and away from activist political organizing. An example is the Ford Foundation and Cesar Chavez, who was, of course, one of the leaders of the National Farm Workers Association in the farm workers movement, um, which was one of the social movements pictured here at the top. So where the found, what the Ford Foundation did was they initially engaged in funding conversations, um, and then they shifted, away from, they shifted away at that time from the strikes and protests in favor of nonprofit service organizations right when the movement faced its most severe challenges with big agriculture and right when they faced their most severe challenges with big agriculture and the police. And so this ultimately compelled Chavez to accept a foundation approved version of farm worker organizing that explicitly disallowed any pressure on the economic sphere. So internally by 1971, there was a movement for greater diversity within sector personnel, but it continued to be a struggle, right? The Council of Foundations affirmed that diversifying boards was a sector-wide imperative in the 1970s. And by the 1980s, women had made the most impressive gains in the sector, particularly white women. In the mid-1970s, 15% of foundation staff were women, and by the 90s, women were overrepresented within the sector. However, despite the inequities and virtually all social problems disproportionately affecting people of color, early in the 90s, a study reported that people of color made up only 14% of boards and only 4% of CEOs. And by the early 2000s, people of color and foundation staff had risen up to 20% and then plateaued. And a decade later, decreased again to 10 to 12 percent of foundation staff. During the same time, CEOs of color increased slightly from 4 percent in the 90s to 8 percent in the 2010s. 
Now, in the mid-1970s and the early 80s, there was also a series of small social justice funding groups that formed. The mid 80s and 90s also saw major development in the creation of identity and affinity based funds, such as ABFI, the Association for Black Foundation Executives, women's foundations, and queer foundations, as well as intermediaries and networks. Longtime grassroots funder Kim Klein has documented how these groups encompass the slogan of the funding exchange to describe the core of their goals change, not charity. They sought to democratize private philanthropy towards community control of grant making published annual reports, grant guidelines, and access to foundation staff, and even to foundation donors were also profound cultural shifts in foundation philanthropy. Now, at the end of this era, we saw an increased austerity and with it an emphasis on charity. Namely, the Reagan administration wanted to limit welfare to the deserving poor and had campaigned on racist portrayals of welfare queens and false claims of welfare fraud. The Clinton administration vowed to end welfare as we know it and did so with the passage of the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act in the mid 90s. Early in his presidency, Reagan appointed the Task Force on Private Sector Initiatives to help federal agencies transfer responsibilities to nonprofits. Independent sector was as a coalition of nonprofits and foundations opposed these kinds of cuts, especially because many nonprofits were funded by the very government grants that the Reagan administration sought to cut. What we've seen since is the size of philanthropy has ballooned. This includes the rise of modern corporate philanthropy from many businesses such as Arco, Oil Company, and AT&T. At the beginning of this period, about 18,000 foundations were established with $19 billion in net assets. By 2016, about 50 years later, the number of foundations almost quadrupled with 67,000 foundations and net assets multiplied by 43 times to over $831 billion. And yet, this is only a small proportion compared to the overall federal budget. The growth of philanthropy is also reflected in key infrastructure developments during this time such as academic centers to study philanthropy, as well as communications such as the Chronicle of Philanthropy. And lastly, for this era, philanthropy has shown its capacity to influence federal legislation, especially on policies for social change. A largely celebrated success for philanthropy has arisen from the Healthcare for the Homeless program in the 80s, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Pew Memorial Trust. This program has been assessed as a result of the convergence of a well-designed demonstration project working nationally with several cities with a policy window opened by a campaign by homeless advocates begun earlier in the decade and increased visibility of the impacts of homelessness decades before. While this undoubtedly increased gains for unhoused peoples, a consideration looking back cautions that pushing certain legislation can make it harder to work with politicians on more progressive legislation later on. And we'll pause here to wrap up um, half of this era uh, from the 19, uh, through the Cold War into the 1990s. And um, let's see if we have any questions or comments on that section. Still nothing. Give you a quick minute here while we're switching over our speakers again. Tiana, anything you notice in that uh, section that catches your imagination? <laughs> Helps if I unmute. Um, I think. Part of it is how often um, organizations that are led by people of color to be able to um, get what they need are having to kind of acquiesce some of their own mission or um, mm. cut back on some things, like the, just the concessions that sometimes mm. they have had to make or a lot mm. of times have had to make so that they can um, at least start making some inroads um, versus, you know, tr you know, foundations and those with the money, like really trying mm -hmm. to listen to what it is that they need and see, well, where do I need to make some changes and some shifting um, so that across yeah. the, 
the board, everybody is getting what they need that, you know, it's not just my group that is, you know, has good health care and lives in a place that doesn't have a lot of issues that, you know, a, a home that is warm and safe to live in, a neighborhood mm-hmm. that is safe to live in. Um, you know, those are some of the things that really stood out to me um, as I was looking at this material um, mm-hmm. as you were going over it today. Yeah, and that brings to mind, there's a great um, research piece done that's published by um, Echoing Green and Bridgespan about the um, disparities between funding of white-led and black-led organizations and what that leads to, you know, over time. Um, And then also as part of that study, they looked not just at the quantitative, but then the qualitative piece where um, leaders of color are asked, you know, what are the barriers? And, um, you know, without getting access to leadership and funding, of course, they, they don't get the opportunity then to form those relationships. So there's, you know, and it's just like a vicious cycle, right? Because you don't know people. Um, so trust isn't as strong because the partnership, you know, we, we look at partnerships as trustful relationships. And, and so securing support, um, financial or otherwise, becomes more difficult. Um, maintaining, building rapport, you know, maintaining these relationships um, it's it's a hard road. And a lot of that has to do with being shut out from funding because you're not even a part of the conversation. So a great, a great study. Mm-hmm. All right, um, shall I we, love the comment uh, here yeah. from Danielle Locks. Um, Danielle says, it's amazing how many people believe that there were quote unquote deserving poor. Um, amazing may be the wrong word, but it's really <laughs> flooring. And I absolutely agree, Danielle, that it that, that mm-hmm. mindset, like I can't even wrap my mind around how do you, like, how is that? You know, Carol, you and I were talking about how words matter and mm-hmm. how some people that their poverty stricken, it's there, it was yeah. in a lot of cases beyond their control right. um, where they were in a place where they needed additional financial assistance to yeah, be able not, to just like, meet their basics. Well, and as we show in this presentation, it's not just, um, you know, again, it's not of their choosing or of their making. I mean, the deck, deck was stacked against them, you know, look who had the money. And then of course people don't, I mean, we, we hear these things, but to see it laying that lay, laid out like this historically, like, you know, people didn't earn the money they wanted, you know, we still have that conversation today about minimum wage um, and this great resignation where nobody wants to go back to work. It's like, well, why? You know, right. of course they don't want to go back to work. <laughs> you know, what's what's the work? You know, why work for ten dollars an hour and no health insurance? I mean, it just doesn't even make sense. Um, and so we're still we still see these same kinds of barriers. I see another comment from Angela. Agreed. Although I'd flip that sentence and say it's flooring. How many people believe there are undeserving poor? Exactly. Right. Um, we all deserve, right? I mean, it's it is. It's. And again, when you think like the reason that many people are lacking in financial resources, why they're poor is because of these, you know, historical and ongoing, you know, it's, it's through the history of their family. Um, You know, it's not due to, again, just it's, it's been foisted upon them. Right. Thank you. All right. right. Um, Shall we get into the second? Yep. Second right, part of this, this era, one. which is the digital era. Um, Oops, we don't want that. Okay, there. All right. um, good to go. Yes. Okay. So the digital era is going to get us up through uh, from 2000 up through basically the present. So a few quick but important themes to know regarding this period include the continued lack of funding to BIPOC-led organization and communities in the face of increasing visibility of racism and structural lack of access to resources. As a result of the last several decades, concentration of wealth has turned to a select few. And by this period, the middle class has shrunk significantly. And in recent years, a return to the suspicion of philanthropy is present, as Carol and I were talking about that a little bit earlier. 
um, like in several years, due to the vast number of foundations and not enough oversight on where the money goes and on the continued power over grantees. Today, it is also apparent that big philanthropy is held by the wealthiest few, which is the reality of inequity. Are your slides good, Carol? Okay. I think Perfect. so. Okay. All right, that brings us to our last period, the 21st century, where we see the rise of widespread digital technology as a key cultural marker. It is a stark time between modern local and global social movements, the high hopes for the Obama administration and the rise of the Trump administration. Climate change has become an increasingly visible crisis through vulnerability to natural disasters. And for philanthropy, there have been significant efforts toward embracing diversity and inclusion in the sector. This includes the creation of justice-focused funders and research and reports focused on tracking closing disparities towards equity. Philanthropy has seen a rise in the ability to communicate using technology, as well as tracking data across the years. Rooted in similar ideas of giving away wealth during one's lifetime we saw over a century ago, Bill Gates launched the Giving Pledge in 2010. Important thought work on how to do philanthropic work continues while coalitions and networks play a key role in these efforts. We're gonna end our timeline at 2020. And what a year that was. I know um, all of us have been impacted by it. With COVID-19 being declared a worldwide pandemic, it surely shed a bright light on the inequities that exist in the US. Um, I think for a lot of people, it was the first time that they really realized what some of these inequities were, where the people who were uh, experiencing those inequities have known it for a very, very long time. Black people and other people of color are disproportionately harmed by COVID-19. So what is the role of philanthropy in achieving equity? And more importantly, social and racial justice. What does the future look like? While there have been some gains in the field, there is still work to do to ensure true equity and justice for BIPOC communities. So if you've got any comments that you wanna share about that, Carol, any thoughts from you um, on what stood out to you during this? You're, you have to unmute, Carol. Really? Um, yeah, we have a couple of comments in the chat. Um, awesome. Let me see what people are saying. Um, um, so we're getting some positive uh, feedback on our presentation. So thank you very much. It's very kind. Um, and somebody's talking about what's happening with Mansion wanting to add work requirements for child tax credits. Exactly this like work for your money in the welfare system. Um, you know, these kinds of things they are all indicators of that exact same thought pattern um, and what's happening, you know, at the federal level and things like that as well. So it is it is disturbing um, to see how some of this they're trying to codify really within federal law um, some of this. And we've seen this happen before. Right. I mean, that's what redlining was. It was codified ways of keeping people in their place. Right. Correct. Um, we have another comment, Sarah Wright says, my father told me once that the greatest sin you could commit in the US is to be and remain poor. I've been thinking about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's true, right? Um, what that means. And here's somebody sharing a nonprofit quarterly article uh, written by the leader of their organization about his experience as a new black leader of a historically white led organization, mm -hmm. which would be mm -hmm. very interesting indeed. Yes. Yeah. Well, that reminds me of a blog post um, I don't have oh. the link right here, but the mm -hmm. blog post that we had um, about a Black woman who mm -hmm. is leading a foundation uh, fund. Yeah. Um, it's the Black Women and Girls Fund, and I believe it is mm -hmm. based in Baltimore, Maryland. And so talking about her experience in the sector and what that has looked like in terms of what the percentage of funding that... Um, nonprofits that are either led by a person of color, founded by a person of color, compared to their white counterparts, uh, the percentage is very, very small, mm -hmm. um, con considering. Um, yeah. Question from Angela. 
She says, I feel like we have missed the crowdfunding piece of philanthropy. Is that intentional or am I misunderstanding the parameters of this call? So I feel like that's maybe a good segue into the very last session piece, since we have about five minutes left. Um, let's take a look at what uh, the future holds for us. Uh, you want to pull that up for us, Tiana? All right, we should be all set. You got it. You're at 2070. Yes. Okay. So, um, so where will we be in 50 years? You know, what is this going to look like going forward? And trends like um, crowdfunding, um, the increase in giving circles that we're seeing, all of that will have a huge impact, right? In in what we um, experience in the um, world of philanthropy in the next 50 years. So today, expectations for philanthropy are being discussed. Um, and organizationally, we really need to look at hiring and leadership practices, as well as policies and practices that can recognize and act on racial disparities. And look at how we can help navigate bureaucracies and engage communities leading the way in social change. Um, in terms of practices, we have an opportunity to enact equity practices that grapple with the root causes of issues and embed structural racism analysis into social change. We can embrace ways of supporting organizations and communities that build with Black, Indigenous, and other peoples of color and engage community strengths in significant ways. Both current literature and history support the need for these changes. And again, when we um, look at the crowdfunding piece, and we have another comment on that, um, use of digital platforms seems to favor well-organized organizations while grassroots organizations can be left behind or excluded. And that digital divide during the digital era is a big uh, that is a consideration. Um, and again, if you are able to join us on November 9th, we really go a lot deeper into these topics and actually do a visioning exercise at the end where we look at some of these trends and have those conversations about what does that mean? Um, I think some other interesting work, Tiana, that you and I are engaged in with, um, uh, well, we've had some conversations with Dr. Tyrone McKinley Freeman, right? Yes. Um, about um, this, this kind of changing idea or bringing, and we're excited to be looking at the, like this is really like the traditional and white history timeline of philanthropy. And so we wanna be looking also at the black history and timeline of philanthropy. And that certainly includes things like giving circles and the more um, communal ways of engaging in philanthropy of race right. organizations and, and the role of churches and, and things like that to, to look at what would be considered non-traditional, right? Uh, uh, habits in philanthropy and philanthropy and how we can put those two together. So still engaging in this. Um, yeah, the digital tactics seem like a, a crowd, uh, seem like a competition. So um, we just have, I think we're gonna get cut off here in like a minute. So I just wanna make sure we have a chance to thank you all for being here. Um, again, if you wanna join us in November, I think we can throw that link in the chat again for you um, and just appreciate um, your conversation. And I'm sorry, we have to cut it short, um, but I hope we've been able to spur some, some deeper thinking for you that you can take back with you. Tiana, any final words? No, I think you covered it really well. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is really what we call a taste of philanthropy's quest for equity. So we hope to see you in November.